So this is item 4, Pre-Legislative Scrutiny Finance Tax Appeals Amendment Bill 2019, and this morning we are conducting a pre-legislative scrutiny of the Finance Tax Appeals Amendment Bill 2019. The Bill follows the review of the Tax Appeals Commission, which was sought by the Minister of Finance. The primary purpose of the Bill now before the Committee is to establish the role and responsibilities of the Chairperson of the Tax Appeals Commission. I am very pleased to welcome from the Department of Finance uh, Mr. Ms. Deirdre Donaghy and Mr. Oliver Gilvary. You're very welcome, and equally from the Tax Appeals Commission, Mr. Marco O'Mahony and Ms. Lorna Gallagher, who are both appeal commissioners. Uh, your opening statement and associated material have been circulated to members, and written submissions have also been received from the Revenue Commissioners and the Irish Tax Institute. And just a note on privilege before we start, I wish to advise the witnesses that by virtue of Section 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee, to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. So now I invite the Department of Finance to make your opening presentation. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. So I'd like to thank the Joint Committee for the invitation to address members in relation to pre-legislative scrutiny of the Finance Tax Appeals Amendment Bill 2019, which also amends Part 23 of the Companies Act 2014. Uh, my name is Deirdre Donaghy and I'm the Principal Officer in the Business Tax Unit of the Department of Finance. Um, my unit also has responsibility for oversight and liaison with the Tax Appeals Commission as a body under the aegis of the Department of Finance. Uh, the proposed bill has two parts. Uh, the, the purpose of the first part of the bill is to make amendments to the legislation governing the Tax Appeals Commission, primarily to implement recommendations of an independent review carried out in 2018. Commissioner Mark Romani and Commissioner Lorna Gallagher from the TAC have also accepted the committee's invitation to attend today. The second part of the bill relates to the transposition of the EU prospectus regulations via an amendment to Part 23 of the Companies Act 2014. I will speak about both parts of the bill in the statement, and my colleague Oliver Gilvari, Principal Officer in the Markets and Securities Unit of the Department, is available to address any questions from committee members on this aspect of the bill. The Tax Appeals Commission was established on the 21st of March 2016 under the Finance Tax Appeals Act 2015, taking over from the former Office of the Appeal Commissioners. The Commission was set up as an independent body with its own vote and accounting officer, with a view to providing increased transparency and an enhanced appeals mechanism for taxpayers. Since its establishment, staffing at the Commission has grown from two commissioners and four administrative staff to three commissioners and 13 administrative staff at various grades. However, a number of factors have contributed to the development of a backlog of appeals within the TAC. On establishment, the Commission inherited 282 cases from the Office of the Appeal Commissioners, but during 2016, over 2,700 additional legacy appeals were transferred from revenue to the TAC. Changes to the appeals process have also resulted in a significant increase in the number of new appeals arising, as all taxpayer appeals are now notified to the TAC in the first instance rather than revenue. As a result, a backlog of appeals has developed, currently standing at approximately 3,650 appeals. On foot of the growing backlog and requests for significant e extra resources, the Minister for Finance commissioned an independent review of the workload and operations of the Tax Appeals Commission in 2018. The review was conducted by Ms. Neva Donoghue, a former Secretary General of the Department of Social Protection. The review examined the governance structures, workload and operations of the Commission and the resulting report was published on Budget Day in October 2018. Minister Donoghue has expressed his full support for the recommendations and work on implementation is ongoing in both the Department and the TAC. The Commission and the Department of Finance are in regular contact about governance matters and corporate supports. An administration working group has formalised discussions between the Commissioners and Revenue in relation to the administration of appeals and the 2019 estimates provided for a near doubling of the Commission's budget to accommodate the recommended staff increases and improvements to ICT equipment. Recruitment of the recommended additional support staff is being undertaken by the TAC. Following a competition conducted by the Public Appointment Service, the Minister has now authorised the appointment of three additional temporary appeal Commissioners who it is hoped will take up their appointments shortly. The proposed legislation undergoing pre-legislative scrutiny today will enable progression of another key recommendation of the O'Donoghue Review, the appointment of a chairperson of the TAC. 
as the legislation governing the TAC does not provide for the role and responsibilities of a chairperson, recruitment cannot commence until the legislation is amended. The bill will provide that a chairperson, who will also be an appeal commissioner, will be responsible for ensuring the efficient operation of the TAC and will be accountable to the Minister for Finance in this regard. It's envisaged that the establishment of a Commission chairperson will strengthen the body's governance and accountability while bringing the Commission structure in line with other similar bodies. The legislation will also clarify some aspects of the existing appeals legislation in order to facilitate the tax appeals process. It will clarify requirements for both appellants and commissioners with regard to the case stated process under which an appellant may appeal a decision to the t of the TAC to the High Court. Finally, in order to clarify a potential ambiguity, the legislation will make express provision for the TAC to enter into contract. I'll now move on to the second part of the bill, which will amend Part 23 of the Companies Act 2014 as part of the transposition of the EU prospectus regulations. Um, a prospectus is a document that issuers are required to publish when making a public offer of securities or when seeking securities admission to trading on a regulated market in the European Union. The prospectus provides key information about an investment and is intended to assist potential investors in making suitably informed investment decisions. The current prospectus regulations have been in force in Ireland since 2005. The regulations are an important part of the overall investor protection regime as they set out the minimum information and disclosure requirements that apply to offers of securities in Ireland and ensure that the information provided to prospective investors is accurate and not misleading through either the omission of key information or deliberate misstatement. The regulations ensure the integrity and stability of the Irish market as a le leading exchange in Europe for new securities listings. In 2017, the EU agreed a new prospectus regulation that will have direct application in Member States from the 21st of July 2019. Within the EU regulation, there are specific Member State discretions that must be implemented through national legislation. To ensure the continued and effective operation of Ireland's prospectus regime after the 2017 regulation enters into force, it is essential that these discretions are fully transposed before that date. It had originally been intended to complete the transposition through consolidated secondary legislation. However, elements related to Irish prospectus law are also contained in Part 23 of the Companies Act 2014. While the changes are predominantly technical in nature, legal advice received from the Attorney General has indicated that they can only be made through primary legislation. These amendments will update references in Part 23 of the Companies Act to refer to the 2017 EU regulation and the relevant legal definitions. It will also transpose provisions contained in Article 11 of the regulation that restrict the civil liability of certain persons involved in the security offering. The EU regulation grants Member States the power to exempt offers of securities up to a total consideration of 8 million from the requirement to publish a prospectus. Currently, Ireland has a threshold of 5 million. It's proposed pardon me, to increase the threshold to 8 million in line with other Member States, such as the United Kingdom, France, Denmark, Finland and Italy, which will allow smaller firms easier and less costly access to capital markets funding and reduce their reliance on bank financing. Given the increased exemption threshold and following consultation with the Central Bank of Ireland, additional investor protection requirements will also be inserted into the local offer regime under Part 23. As the EU regulation enters into direct force on the 21st of July 2019, the amendments to Part 23 must be enacted prior to that date to ensure that there are no legislative gaps in Ireland's prospectus regime and to meet our European commitments to have the required legislation in place by that date. So this has been a relatively high level overview of the provisions in the proposed legislation. So my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Donaghy. Uh, Senator Burke? Yeah, to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Donaghy to the committee and uh, just maybe one or two questions uh, in relation to uh, the uh, proposed legislation. Um, does, the, does your remit, does it involve uh, the social welfare, we'll say, that has a financial aspect to it as well, that's maybe within the Department of Finance, uh, or is it strictly just the department, the anything that comes under the Department of Finance? No, I'm in the business tax unit in the Department of Finance, so I'm responsible for um, corporation tax primarily, and we have responsibility uh, for the Tax Appeals Commission as a body under the aegis of the department, so it's a liaison role um, in that. But no, we don't have any uh, connection with the Department of Social Protection. 
Yeah, well, in, in relation to the social protection aspect of things, uh, employers have to uh, provide or to pay two weeks per year redundancy to staff that they let go or that they, that they make redundant. And I don't know when exactly it was brought in, but during the downturn when companies got into uh, uh, difficulties and sole traders got into difficulties as well, um, there was a clawback on the two weeks per year from the department, uh, the, the government or the, the Department of Finance paid or, or the Department of Social Welfare paid 70%. But uh, eventually that was, uh, was eroded away, it went from 70 down to 15% and eventually it, was, uh, it, uh, it disappeared altogether. So with the result that any company or any sole trader that, that uh, closed down or that, uh, that uh, downsized, the staff had to get two weeks per year. Now this uh, was implemented a number of years ago, but some of those companies and some of those uh, individuals uh, sole traders were employing people prior to when the two weeks per year was brought in. So um, I just wondered, it's in the Department of Social Welfare, but it's the Department of Finance, the Minister for Finance, that made the, the that, that got rid of the 70% clawback. Uh, sorry, I'm afraid that's nothing that we have any responsibility for. It's a very relevant point to, and it's probably a very important discussion to have but I'm not sure that it's relevant to the tax appeals because this is mainly, as far as I, I can gather, this is mainly about business tax and people appealing their, their tax rulings and so on. Yeah, this would but be... The first half of the bill. Yes, the first part of the bill, it's, it's entirely relates to the Tax Appeals Commission. So they deal with occasions where um, the revenue commissioners have raised an assessment on a taxpayer, be it a corporate or an individual, and the individual doesn't agree with the assessment or right. feels it's incorrect in any way. They then have the avenue of appeal to appeal to the Tax Appeals Commission. Um, who so then... the Tax Appeals, it's a, very, it's a very narrow remit that you have. Yeah, it specifically appeals in relation to uh, tax assessments by revenue. And, but from a tax compliant, uh, the country is very tax compliant at the moment. But you seem to be getting a lot of uh, a lot of appeals, and your your uh, your um, staff wise, you seem to be expanding and, and need more staff. Why? Why? How, can, how do you equate the two? Um, it's, it, it, there's a number of reasons why this has happened. So part of the part of the reason for the backlog at the moment is that there were legacy appeals that were transferred when the Tax Appeals Commission was established. So prior to 2016, um, the, the, the former appeals function that was there for uh, taxpayers was the Office of Appeals Commissioners, and that was within, while it was independent, it was, it was still an organisation within the Revenue Commissioners. So this was then restructured in 2016, and the Tax Appeals Commission was created to improve transparency and you know, it was created as a, an independent body in its own right. So part of the reason for the increases in staffing is that fact that it is now an independent body in its own right and has to look after a lot of things like its own governance, its own administration. So part of it is down to that. But also at the time that the TAC was formally created, um, as I say, over 3,700 legacy appeals were kind of transferred from revenue to the TAC at that time. So a large part of the backlog is, is due to that uh, amount of legacy appeals coming well, over. How long is the, 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 the longest appeal? So they, how far back are they going? Back to 2010 or to 2000? And the whatever? longest they've been with the TAC is since 2016. So that's when, that's when the TAC formally took responsibility for them. Um, some of the older, the legacy appeals that came over, they came over from the revenue commissioners, so um, the TAC wouldn't have had responsibility for them before that time, but some of them would be um, older appeals, yes. So that's, that's the point I'm making. There's some of them going, going way back, so there aren't, uh, there's no decision on. Yes, but as I say, they've only been with the Tax Appeals Commission since 2016 when, when they were formally created, so that's why we're, we're trying to, to work through them now. And why would it take more than three years to, um, to um, deal with a, a, an appeal that's going back maybe to 2010, 2011 or 12? I think the, sh the sheer volume that transferred over is, is the answer for that. Um, that uh, you know, when the, the TAC was created, there was just a huge volume that came in. 
and then there's also been a change to the nature when the TAC was created there was also a change to the, the nature of the appeals process so formerly under the office of the appeals commissioners um, the first line of appeal was to revenue so essentially revenue acted as a filter for a lot of kind of basic appeals where there was you know a misstated number or, or kind of re something relatively uncontroversial or clerical errors those were all filtered out at an early stage whereas now under the new system where the tax appeals commission is the first port of appeal and everything <coughs> must be appealed to the, the TAC within 30 days of the notice what is happening is that there's been a huge increase in the number of appeals coming in to the TAC as compared to the office of the appeals commissioners and then a lot of them are then turn out to be minor issues that are resolved between probably primarily between the taxpayer and revenue either misunderstandings or clarifications but and um, this is another thing that has given rise to a, to a backlog and this is why um, we had the the review done which kind of pointed to where greater resources were needed in particular and that's the purpose of this uh, this bill is to assist in, in putting in those the resources so the, the legacy needed. ones are left on the back foot are they all the time no nope, they're progressing as well so there's one uh, the two commissioners here commissioner omani and, and commissioner gallagher there's also a third commissioner um uh, connor kennedy and his full focus is on the legacy appeals and he's been making strides on specifically on on those legacy appeals and and when do you think the legacy appeals will be completed when will they be finished we'll say and you'll be up to date how long will it take or I think with any appeals process there's a, a certain element of, of how long is a piece of string because it's not entirely under the control of the commissioners. Obviously there's an appellant involved and uh, the revenue commissioners obviously is, as the other part of every appeal. Um, so there are instances when um, an appeal will be delayed because either party is either has requested a delay or is getting additional documentation or is calling a witness or, or any of these kind of reasons. Um, but the purpose of putting in the additional resources into the Commission is to try to imp increase the pace at which these are resolved to get them cleared as soon as possible. Have you received any um, appeals in relation to the property tax? Um, that's one the Commissioners would need to. Mm -hmm. Sir. <clears throat> yes, uh, we, we have dealt with some of those appeals, yes. You have? Yes. Is, is there many or is there... Um, I don't have a number at hand, but I can certainly get that for you. Um, I know that there has been at least one determination that has dealt with local property tax. So yes, um, it has been a subject of our work. And how would, it, how would that come about, this dispute between the, the owner, is it, and um, uh, who may, whoever makes the... Okay, well, um, obviously I'm not um, at liberty to speak okay. about any particular case, but various aspects of the legislation have been challenged by taxpayers um, around, um, for example, um, transfer of properties. So when a property is bought and sold, you know, who remains liable at that time for the property tax, for example, if it's around the payment date or if it's in November particularly, some of those issues have arisen and have been looked at. So yes, we've, so, we've dealt with that. Oh, I see. So um, that's that, just from the top of my head. Yes, one I, of the I, issues I, I that we've, we've looked that, at. Yeah. Yeah. So one person would be saying that, that it should have been paid earlier, and the other person didn't pay it, and yeah. Correct. Who is the owner? Who is the owner of the property at the relevant time, and where does liability fall? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks very much, Senator Burke. Uh, Deputy Murphy. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, just questions on the, the second half of it, um, which seem to be more substantive. Um, just could you outline, please, the uh, rationale for increasing the threshold for prospectus from 5 million to 8 million? Thank you, Deputy. <clears throat> um, the rationale there, the current um, sort of the background, as, as my colleague outlined, the prospectus is basically an information document before you issue securities to the general market. So under the existing framework, the threshold in Ireland was 5 million, so any issuance under 5 million was not subject to the requirements of the prospectus framework as set out in Europe, but it was subject to parts 23 of the Companies Act, which was local offer. So this gives certain level of protections. The rationale for increasing it up to 8 million 
and allowing that discretion at the European level was to basically make it easier for smaller businesses to raise money. Because in reality, what we were seeing was it was big corporates that were able to access the markets, which left smaller entities then basically relying on bank financing. So our rationale for increasing this up to 8 million is to ensure that smaller businesses basically have that choice. They don't have the same level of disclosure requirements as someone like CRH or someone like that. So as a small, smaller business that has a track record of a number of years can go out and issue debt securities or equity. But on the balance of that then is that we have increased certain protections. So as people are investing in this, while you don't have the full framework of the prospectus regulation to apply, we have added additional protections such as the disclosures of the track record over the last number of years, if someone is guaranteeing the product, who that person is and what the level of guarantee is. But the rationale in essence is to make it, make it easier, give it greater options to smaller businesses. And I mean, the, the, the rationale for there being a requirement for a prospectus in the first place is to provide protection to the investor, so the investor has full disclosure, has full information before they invest. Is that correct? The rationale is there that you have the information uh, within the document so that you can make the, a decision on the investment. But the, the issue is that, again, is if you're a big, complex business, so if you're, let's say, mineral extraction, well, what business are you doing in different jurisdictions? Uh, you know, what is the, you know, the risks arising out of that? So there's a lot of detail that has to go in there. But when you look at it from a smaller business perspective, it's more simplistic. You know, they're more like a one line of business, so therefore it's not as if they're operating across jurisdictions, even the jurisdictions outside the European Union. It is a very bespoke. So it could be a business, a fintech business, for example, or a business that is basically you know, setting up a manufacturing business. All the whole aim is that rather than just having the first port of call to go to a bank to get funding or to a venture capitalist, for example, that they have this option that they can actually issue a debt security on uh, markets or uh, issue equity to basically give that alternative financing. Um, and as far as I know, the, the, the regulations, the EU regulations uh, set a minimum threshold of a million, so no country can legislate for a requirement for a prospectus for offers below a million and a maximum of uh, eight million. And we had five million and now it's proposed to increase it to the, to the maximum to, to eight million. Um, as far as I can tell, the British government changed from, I'm not sure what it was, but they changed it up to 8 million, up to the maximum in July of last year. Is that a factor in the thinking of the department? And no. Um, throughout the whole negotiations of the prospectus regulation up to 2017, we, all, all, we always called for the increase in the level. At the level of 5 million was set back in really the negotiations started, I think, in 03, and then the directive was agreed in 05, and was to reflect, in essence, you know, the changing market and also what we have experienced following the, um, you know, the crisis where we saw basically banks pulling back from the market so, uh, and then linking this into the whole CMU project, Capital Markets Union project, to try and deepen Europe's capital markets so that in essence you have those different options. So it wasn't just solely that the UK moved throughout the whole negotiations up to 2017, we always called for a higher level. Uh, in the negotiations, and as uh, my colleague outlined, a large number of other member states have pro provided for the eight million, uh, along with the UK. And what's what's the average in the EU? Obviously, the, the states are listed that also have a threshold of eight million. But what's the average of other states? The sorry, I just uh, so the majority have moved up to eight million. Just one second, I have. One second, my colleagues. Have. Yeah. So we have then the basically the United Kingdom, France, Denmark, Finland, and Italy have set their thresholds at eight million, and then there's roughly around about another six, seven member states that have set the threshold uh, around the one million mark uh, from the, the numbers that we've got so far. What I would say for those other member states, they would include the likes of Romania, Bulgaria, where they would have, again, smaller markets. So it, it comes back to the point of, what well, an SME business in Romania or Bulgaria, a million is a significant amount, whereas a kind of a smaller business here and in those other member states, you know, a level closer up to, to eight million. So I'd say, 
you know, the average would be just above, I think, about maybe around six million, but we can get the exact figures from what we have uh, there. But there, the states that have moved up to eight million. Yeah, so lo looking at the figures there online, it seems that the mode is five million. Um, there's, I guess, 12 states, I could be slightly off there, that, that have five million, including Germany, which is obviously isn't subject to, oh, it's a very small market, etc. Austria, Belgium, um, other you know, substantial states, um, with large countries, large economies, uh, etc. So what, what, why does it make sense for us to go up to 8 million when the likes of Germany and so on are, are staying at, at 5 million? Well, uh, what Germany have done there is Germany have a 5 million base threshold, but they have the option going up to 8 million. Mm -hmm. So, and then the issuer must produce and publish a securities information sheet, sheet approved by BaFin, the German uh, financial regulator. And yes. then that is offered in conjunction with investment advice or investment brokerage by an investment firm. So. What we have done is, in part 23, is that we have basically the requirements that are set out for the entity. So the Germans have kind of gone at this a bit different in that, look, 5 million is the threshold, but you can go up as far as 8 million with these protections. What we have done is we have put 8 million with these protections and disclosures that must be done. And then if there is an intermediary in Ireland that is basically selling that security, whether it's a MIFID entity or whether it's an investment uh, intermediary uh, act authorised entity, there is the conduct of business requirements that the central bank is the competent authority for there. So that's why we have we feel comfortable in moving it up to it. and made that recommendation. And say if, if I am a multinational corporation, right, um, and I want to uh, offer a security of seven million euros, and I operate across the EU, can I do it in any country I want, or do I have to do it in the country in which? I'm, I'm based in, or no? You can pick the jurisdiction. So, sorry, in in the sense of under to do it under the prospectus regulation, or to do it under local offer. Say, if I want to take advantage of the fact that if I'm looking for seven million, if I do it in Austria, I would have to issue a prospectus. I don't want to issue a prospectus. Can I do it in in Ireland to avoid doing that? But the issue then I would have is the local offer is the local framework. Uh -huh. So you are caught then, so your ability then to basically offer that, you, you don't have a prospectus then that will allow you to be able to base, uh, offer the security across the union. So it limits you then, basically, it is the domestic framework. So the benefit of the prospectus regulation is it doesn't matter where I do my listing. Uh -huh. I do a prospectus, so I'm an Austrian company, I do my prospectus in Ireland. I list in an Irish market or I list in a UK market or a German market, I can sell, I have no problems across the union. The prospectus is the prospectus. The local offer framework then limits me. I don't get that flexibility. So hence, it's no use for a big multinational to go, look, I only need 7 million. I'm an Austrian based, I'll just do 7 million in Ireland or I'll do 7 million in, in Germany. I'm going to be caught because then I'm just in that market where I will want broader. And the other benefit of the prospectus regulation is internationally it's, it's seen as the standard. So Europe has this framework, that's the framework. So if I'm buying a security that is subject to a prospectus issued under the prospectus regulation, I have comfort with the framework that Europe has put in place on that. Okay, final question. Thanks a lot. Um, so in, no, no part of this is about um, competing for business in the sense of competing for companies to come here to offer securities here by virtue of having a higher threshold, that, really, that dynamic doesn't really exist. This is basically to give options for Irish entities as they're starting off. And like, to be fair, it's not the entity that basically starts off in the morning. It's one, it's kind of as you're moving through the stages of your financing. So, you know, you'll start off, you'll get your track record, just that you're not, you have the options there. It's not replacing bank financing, it's not replacing other, it is that just that other option. And then allows you, basically, we have increased the threshold to give that more flexibility. Okay, thanks a lot. Deputy Murphy, Senator O'Donnell. Thanks. Um, can I just go back uh, just to do a quick recap on the, the tax appeals? So before this, we would have had the normal um, the appeals commissioner's office. And were appeals also, go I mean, you, if you made an appeal, you'd make an appeal, with, say, to the local revenue office or district, right? So. Was there a, a distinction in the type of appeals that were being heard? Were some being heard? What was the <coughs> distinction that one went to the, we'll say, the, uh, the appeals commissioner, um, the tax appeals commissioner, right? Um, and one would have gone to um, well, yeah, the office of the appeals commissioner, and one would have gone to the revenue. Can you just explain <coughs> what the old system was? 
Under the old system, because uh, the Office of the Appeals Commissioner, it was within revenue, so the, the appeal came, it, the appeal was made to revenue, essentially. So what that meant was that at, at an early stage, if there was something more straightforward, like just an error in a number, or someone said, oh, you know, for a PAYE assessment, I am entitled to this credit, or I'm not entitled to this credit, those are very straightforward things that are that could be sorted didn't out. have to go to the appeals they, commissioner. They're not really an appeal as <clears throat> yeah, yeah. such. It's more yeah. of maybe a misunderstanding a or review, an error yeah. that can be clarified between a normal, uh, a normal revenue and no. official. And now, what happens is that if an individual receives a notice of appeal, uh, sorry, a notice of assessment, they have 30 days in which to appeal that assessment. So the <coughs> inclination is to immediately appeal it to the tax appeals commission. And they may or may not also contact revenue if, if it's a straightforward error. So there are a certain amount then that there, there are always a, a volume of cases that would be appealed and that would create an appeal that takes uh, processing time. How, how, the, are they, how are they weeded out? How are, they, how are you able to get at them under um, the new system? Under the new system? It's just, if you want to maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I think, Senator, the, uh, once an appeal comes to us, one of the first steps we have to take is to notify Revenue that an appeal has been brought because they don't know that now. And the notice of appeal that we receive has details of the, the appellant's complaint, the taxpayer's complaint. So that goes to Revenue and we do see that uh, where there are very, very simple differences between revenue and the taxpayer, where it's a, a straightforward error on, on one part or the other, that can very often be resolved without much further input from us. So there is, there is a degree of, of, of drop-off at that early stage. What I'm really interested in is, is on the establishment of the Commission heard 282 cases from the Office of the Appeals Commission, that's straightforward. And 2,700 additional legacy appeals were transferred from the revenue seems an exceptionally high number relative to the amount that was with the Appeals Commissioner. How did that, how did that happen? I, I suppose uh, these were cases that were with the Revenue Commissioners. They had been notified to the Revenue Commissioners but hadn't been transferred on to the old Office of the Appeals Commissioners. Even, even though they were on appeal? The, yes, correct. I, again, as, as, as we said, Senator, that there were uh, the revenue almost acted as a filter on yeah. appeals in the first instance. Uh, these were ones that were still at that filter stage. Uh, the act that established us provided a, a mechanism so that, so, whereby... So the 3,650 is now probably a complete figure of the number of cases under appeal, whereas prior to that we probably didn't know the full figure. That, that's figure. Yes, that's correct. So. What's the average waiting time for uh, an appeal to be heard now relative to what it was prior under the old system? How long are people waiting for their cases to be heard? Uh, it's difficult to say how long somebody is waiting for a case to be heard because different categories of cases have... How do you prioritise? Tell me how you do it in practice in the, the, office, in the new... Uh, keep uh, the names... What do you call now? The Tax Appeals Commission. So, in the Tax Appeals Commission, tell me the process that you determine. Case, case comes in, it's logged. How long before that case will be heard? The average uh, since 2016 from the date we receive a notice of appeal to the date that the appeal is closed, which isn't necessarily hearing, it can be settled or can be withdrawn or we can refuse it, is 353 uh, days, Senator. A year? Yes, but obviously there are cases that take much longer than that, there are cases that are resolved more quickly than that. It really depends on how complex the appeal is. The more complex an appeal is, the more issues that are raised in the appeal, the likelihood is it will take longer for the parties to get ready uh, for the appeal and it will it'll take longer uh, for us to get to the stage where we can say this matter is now ready what for the Under the old system, how long, was the, how long were people waiting? The 282 I, cases, typically how long were they waiting? I, I don't know the answer to that and I, I'm not even sure that I can get it for you, Senator. I don't think records were kept. Uh, I, I, a year I, is too long. I was in practice for many years. So I was a practitioner. If, if, if someone comes to me, like we're, I suppose, if we're setting up new bodies, those new bodies should be cutting down the time. This is really... Uh, like a court of law, it's the appeal. It should be much quicker. These are people, typically, that have appealed. Many of them that would have major impact in their business. 
I think their waiting a year is too long. Okay. The average waiting time of year is way too long. We, we so the question is, if it's a problem with resources, um, like the devil is always in the detail. This looks great and it's, and it's fantastic, right? But if I, I'm there and I have a client and they're under severe pressure and they are getting nowhere with their local district and there's a case and they appeal this case, uh, can, can barristers appear before the Appeals Commission? Okay. Yes, they can. Um, so you could have serious incurment of costs, right? I think a year is too long. So the question I'm asking is, how can we get it down? Well, I think today is an important part in that process, uh, Senator. I mean, the, uh, the legislation uh, is to allow for the appointment of a chairman who's also going to be uh, an appeal commissioner. So at the moment, there are three commissioners. Um, as uh, Ms Donaghy said in her opening statement, uh, the Minister has approved the appointment of another three, uh, sorry, another three uh, temporary appeal commissioners. And how, how does the process work? So, for instance, I, I put in an appeal. There's obviously an executive within the, 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 the appeals office. Um, how many people are in the appeals office? What, what's the qualifications of the people? Are they accountants? Are they tax? What are they? Um, how are they heard? Do they have to be heard at oral hearings? Uh, how often do the oral hearings sit? Uh, do they sit over the summer? Uh, exactly how does it work in practice? You might just walk, walk me through that, Mr. Romain. Well, I suppose uh, dealing first with the question of uh, a staff senator, we have a staff of uh, 15 at the moment, one of whom works on a, a, a part time basis. Um, what, the, what, what, are they, what are their qualifications? Uh, they, they vary uh, significantly, I suppose, in terms of specialist qualifications. We have three case managers at the moment, all of whom are chartered tax advisors with uh, five years uh, experience. They come, uh, I think, from a, a revenue uh, an accounting and a, a legal background, respectively. They were appointed in January and, and uh, April. Is one of them from the Revenue Commissioners? Came well, out one of them worked for the, the Revenue okay. Commissioners previously. Yeah. And, the, other uh, 50, the, other, the other 12? They, they are, uh, our staff are divided into three units. Three units. There's the case managers, as I already described. We have yeah. a, an appeal support unit. Uh, and then we have a, a, a scheduling unit. Um, that's a, a division of work that we, we've uh, settled on in the past year. So who works physically, who works? The appeal support unit, I'm assuming, is the administrative side of people putting in their appeals. Scheduling unit is, is, is saying when, when the cases will be heard. So how many people are actually physically working on the cases? Well, uh, I, I would have said 14. Uh, no, plus, no. The, plus the commissioners. No. Who's, how many people are physically sitting down with the file in front of them? They're looking at the appeal in technical terms and studying the appeal. Many of these are administrative staff. I want to know how many people are physically working on the files uh, to decide how the, was to decide whether there's the basis of an appeal or whatever. I, and, and again, I suppose when an appeal comes in, when a notice of appeal comes to us in the first instance. Uh, it will go to the uh, the appeals support team. They are responsible for logging it on the case management system, for notifying the That's revenue. That's administration, Mr. Manny. That's administration. But, but I, want, sorry. I want to know how many people are sitting down with a case file in front of them and are working on the case files. The administrative, you have to have an administrative backup. But ultimately, what determines the length of a case is is the we know it from dealing with the ombudsman's office. Who's the actual case worker? Who's the, the case manager? So I, I want to know how many people are physically working on scrutinising files. I, I suppose, and I'm sorry if I misunderstood yeah. your question, Senator. In terms of looking at an appeal and maybe looking at the merits of an appeal or considering points in relation to how it needs to be progressed from a legal perspective, uh, there would be the, uh, some members of the, uh, the appeal support team will identify whether or not there's an issue. If they feel that there is, it goes to the, one of the three case managers, and the case managers will either answer that question themselves, or if they feel that it, it's a, an issue that needs to be escalated, they'll bring it to one of the, uh, the appeal commissioners. And so when, when you have the case managers, right, give me the process from there to be heard by an appeals commissioner, how that happens. 
Well, I suppose, sorry, one of the questions you asked was, does every appeal need uh, an oral hearing? And the answer is, they don't. We do have powers under okay. Section 949U to do uh, a hearing uh, on the papers, and that's one which we obviously avail of uh, whenever it's possible. In terms of uh, the responsibilities of the case managers in, in getting it uh, to a hearing stage, they will look generally at the more complex appeals. Um, if it's a, a question where, for example, outlines of arguments are needed from the parties, which again would generally be appeals that raise reasonably In complicated... In the time I have, Mr Manny, I understand that. Each of the case workers has 1,200 cases on their files at any one time because there's 3650. That's too many. That's, that's for me, it's basic stuff. This is where the logjam is. If you're expecting three case managers to be able to pull back on a year's time, the appeals commissioner is great. But did you look for any more resources in terms of, of case managers? One, one of the recommendations of the O'Donoghue report is in another, another two uh, case managers. Are you getting those? Senator. We have applied to the PAS for access to a panel, and we're hoping uh, that by the third quarter of this year we should have uh, two case managers. We've already been indicated, it's already been indicated to us that there are some candidates who look like they would be suitable having regard to their skill set and qualifications. That's something that we're actively pursuing. How many, how many cases at the moment, so there's 3650 under appeal, how many cases at the moment have, have, have been dealt with by the case managers and are awaiting being heard by the appeals commissioners themselves? How many cases have, have the executive their work done and they are waiting for the appeal hearings to be for the appeal commissioner to hear the case? Well, to look at the case. I, I, I can say that uh, we, we recently conducted a, a big review and every case that needed sorry, every case that needed case manager attention has been looked at by a case manager. Fine. In terms of the number of cases that are ready for hearing, I might just see if my colleague has that information. Uh, sorry, Senator. We have currently have uh, 80 cases scheduled for hearing. Uh, there's going to be a further 90 uh, scheduled this year, and at the moment there's about another 100 uh, cases that have been deemed ready for, for a hearing. We're just awaiting for the appointment of the three additional temporary commissioners. That's roughly, that's roughly about 270 cases at the moment that could be heard by the Appeals Commission. So, for me, there's two log jams. You haven't enough case managers, clearly, uh, and you haven't to. You, certainly, the one additional appeals commissioner will take a huge. The 270 should be. Typically, how many cases a year would appeals commissioner hear? Uh, I think we had 165 cases listed for hearing uh, last year. Uh, so. Uh, not all of those will go to a hearing, the parties may settle, but uh, on average about uh, 55 a year per commissioner. So that uh, would and, be and I suppose, I'd, if I could just add to that, part of our difficulty last year, Senator, was uh, we moved to new offices in June. Prior to June, uh, we didn't have a hearing room in our old premises. We had to go to local hotels to get, uh, to get a hearing, uh, to get so a function. The question really is, is, you have a year of waiting time to be heard from an appeals commissioner, which I think is just unacceptable, right, for clients and for, it's just too long. Uh, so the question is, how can we get back to, let's say, three months? Uh, and basically what you're telling me there at the moment, under the current system, if the three commissioners are hearing roughly about 150 cases each a year, that's only roughly about 400 a year. I mean, to take out, and you probably have, how many ad additional cases have you coming here? Like, the if we're setting up a new system, yep. a new system must be more efficient in time than the old system. And I'm not convinced the current new system, it's good architecture, but there has to be a time factor here. So the question I'm asking really is, is it's great to get the new appeals commissioner and the case workers, but this time next year, how many additional cases are coming in per year? Do you know how many cases are, we'll say, roughly how many? About 1,800 a year. 
So we have a serious problem then, because you have 365 over years, you have 1,800 coming in a year, you're seeing approximately about 150 per commissioner. So if you put on four, at best you're talking about, what, 600 cases a year. Yeah, I, but I, can, yeah. I, can I just, firstly, I suppose the point you make about the waiting time being unacceptable is one we completely accept. It's one that the, the, the department accepts and, and has, uh, we, we've all addressed it. You're absolutely right, the hearing time needs to be brought down and, and today is part of that process. In terms of uh, dealing with the level of appeals, not all appeals will require a hearing. Not all will, uh, will, will even be, be set a hearing date. So there isn't perhaps a direct cor correlation between the number of appeals that we receive every year and the number, number of hearings that we're, we're required to carry out. I mean, we, uh, we doubled in 2018 the number of cases that, cases that we closed. It was 20, in 2017, it was 700. In last year, it, it was 1,440 uh, odd. We, we are getting there, but you're absolutely right. That's, that's why we're here today. The waiting list needs to be brought down. The, the chairman is one part of it, but we have sanctioned from the minister for a doubling uh, of our staff numbers okay. uh, with, the, with the announcement that there's going to be three temporary commissioners. We're going from three commissioners uh, to six and we're confident that there is going to be a, a significant improvement. So you're going in from three to six commissioners and you're going from three case managers to five. Okay. Okay, well then look, I, I, I won't labour the point, I suppose. Look, it was always a frustration and the view I take in it really is that have you, have you a, a target in terms of what you believe would be a reasonable waiting time for a case to be heard on an appeal? Have you set, as, as an institution, have you set a target? I've mentioned three months. Have you set a target yourselves? We, we, we haven't yet, uh, Senator. I think we need to... We haven't yet reached full operational strength. Um, it's something that we're going to look at when we have an idea of what our workload is, what our proper level of resourcing is, but you're absolutely right. There needs to be targets. We need to be we need to be held to a standard, but we're just not in a position to put a, a date on it yet. I think the the reality is, reality is ultimately we will have a, a classification of appeals. So we might say a simple appeal should be closed off by the commission on average within X months. A medium complexity appeal within two X months. A very complex appeal within two years to, to pick a, a, a figure at random, but we do accept there has to be targets and, uh, and that's something we are actively considering. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Burke, do you want to come back here? Just very briefly, uh, uh, Mr. Danny, you, you liaise between the, the commissioners and the Department of Finance as, as the principal officer. Under the new proposed legislation, uh, there's going to be a chairman uh, appointed and he's going to uh, report directly to the Minister for Finance. Does that mean then that there'll be no contact once the appeal goes from the Department of Finance over to the, to the Appeals Commissioner, or once they get the, uh, an appeal, there'll be no contact between the Commissioners and the Department of Finance? No, we'd anticipate there'd be uh, ongoing contact during the year. Um, there, there is at the moment as well. Um, the, the primary purpose of having a, a commissioner, uh, or sorry, a chair, is that particularly as the numbers of commissioners increase, it's important to have one identified head of the office who is responsible. So under the Act, there are a number of different um, things that the commissioner, that the, at the moment, the commission, but uh, the purpose will be to focus this on, on the chair, must do in terms of putting reports to the minister, for example. Um, but the, uh, the TAC will remain a body under the aegis of the Department of Finance. So it's, a, a, it's a, a body that's statutorily independent in the exercise of its functions as an appeals body. But nonetheless, it is accountable to the department in terms of its expenditure and the delivery of its functions. So we have ongoing contact with the commissioners, for example, in terms of their, their annual budget, uh, their annual spend, um, we would have constant contact in relation to, for example, answering parliamentary questions. So that is something that would continue um, through the year. Um, but the idea is that the chairman would essentially be the one identifiable person who has the overall responsibility for ensuring that the TAC is meeting its requirements. So will there not be 
a strain at sometimes between the Secretary General of the Department of Finance and the Chairman of the TAC. I think these are our relationships that we're we're very accustomed to managing. Um, so yeah, but it's, it doesn't seem to me from the from your statement that it's well defined as to how the role of authority is going to be, whether it's the Secretary General is the is the boss, and the the chairman of the T, the TAC reports to the Secretary General. Does the does it, will the chairman be reporting to the mm -hmm. Secretary General, or is he completely independent and uh, reports to? Uh, the Minister for Finance? The Chairman will be answerable to the Minister of Minister for Finance, but the reality is that all of these bodies that are answerable to the Minister, that is managed by officials within the Department. Um, well, let's see. Thanks, Senator Burke. Just a few questions myself. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think anyone's really addressed the point. I mean, I presume Obviously, a lot of the tax appeals are corporate entities or businesses and so on. But equally, there are individuals, there are sole traders, there are people who are, you know, income tax and so on that's, that's appeal here. Um, and it must be, I'm sure, for them, a very stressful scenario as to whether or not they may have to pay an amount or may not have to pay an amount. How does the whole interest in penalties and all, is that all suspended during the, for the process of the tax appeal? Or, I mean, do, they, do, do you pay the tax and then hope you get it back? Or is it... Is it, is it in limbo, or how does that work in terms of just the, the process? Uh, Chairman, the, um, the taxpayer has the option to pay the tax that's in dispute while uh, an appeal is pending, but they're not uh, obliged to do so. If they do pay the tax, then obviously there's no, uh, there's no interest charge uh, at the conclusion of the appeal if they're unsuccessful. If they are successful, then the revenue commissioners then refund uh, the tax that's been paid. Uh, if they don't pay the tax, then yes, there is statutory interest accruing if the, if the appeal is ultimately found to be uh, unsuccessful. But there, be, there wouldn't be penalties, would there? No, I, I, don't, uh, I don't believe further penalties would accrue in the interim. They would have crystallised at the time that the and tax the interest rate, do you know what the interest rate is? I don't know off the top of my okay. head, Chairman. I'm sorry, we can... Um, is, is there a breakdown of how much money is in the system being appealed? At, as of the 20th of May, it was some 3.67 uh, billion, uh, Chairman. So the, the, these 3,650 or thereabouts cases, it's worth about 3.6 or 7 billion yes. euro. Of, of, which, of, in so theory, the state, if it's got it, might have to give it back. Uh, and if it doesn't, it's, it's, so there's the guts of 4 billion euro sitting, or 3.6 billion euro potentially not available to the state or available state, depending. It's a very significant amount of money in terms of fiscal space and other figures that we talk about, 100 million here or 200 million there. So thank, thank you for um, at least knowing that figure and, and giving it to us. Is there a split of, is there 20% of cases that are 80% of that value and 80% of cases with very small value? Or have you a breakdown of the, the what's the biggest appeal? The, the top 10 uh, appeals by quantum and dispute amount to some 2.5 a billion of the, the, the 3.67, Chairman. And of those top 10, are they being actively and aggressively managed and, and investigated? It, it, in as much as we can, uh, two of them, one of the, the circumstances where we can't progress an appeal is if there are parallel proceedings before the courts and the courts have stayed, uh, have stayed the appeal before us while the court proceedings are ongoing. So. At the moment, two of the top ten are stayed by court order. We, we can't do anything in relation to them. And the value of those two appeals is, is 1.67 billion. Uh, okay. Chairman. And the, the, in, the, the, the single biggest figure is how much? Uh, it, I'm, it, it's in excess of a billion. I'm, I'm reluctant to discuss okay. precise figures, Chairman. Yes. Uh, we obviously owe a duty of confidentiality. I accept that, but I'm not asking for names or, or even the kind of business they're in or anything. It's just a... a a numerical amount of the highest claim, that's all. Just, just to give people who are looking in at this an idea of, you know, there are obviously people appealing their property tax, it's not going to be a billion, and there are people who are appealing an ordinary assessment, you know, of their personal circumstances in a, in a couple or an individual, um, which is not going to be a billion either, I'd imagine. But it's just to give a flavour of, of what's here, because a, a lot of people would not be that familiar with the Tax Appeals Commission. And I, I think the, the main thrust of this legislation is really appointing a chairman and giving the chairman a role. Uh, yes. The Tax Appeals Commission has already been set up and inherited um, legacy cases, and it's getting in. in. In terms of throughput, if you like, 
Um, we have these legacy cases. We have the case that were inherited. Um, and you're getting new cases every year and you're clearing cases every year. Is there a kind of a, uh, an in and out schedule of what's happening in, in terms of that? Can you give us a, a yes, slightly I, better picture of that? I, I can give you those numbers, uh, Chairman, if you bear with me one moment. Um, in uh, sorry, working backwards in 2019 up to the 20th of May, we've received 557 appeals and we've closed 356 uh, in 2000. Of the 557 or just 356 of the total? No, no, just, just 356. I mean, I, I suspect the reality is the 556 that were closed are more likely to, to relate to earlier years. Um, obviously, yes. there's, a, there's a degree of time lag. Mm -hmm. In 2018, uh, we received 1,689 appeals. We closed 1,438. Uh, and in 2017, we received 1,747, and we closed 690. Okay, so in, in each year, we have a, a deficit in this year of over just over 200, last year of 200 and something, and the year before, almost 1,100. So the backlog is... It's getting worse every year. It, 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 it has been. Now, as I say, as, as I said uh, in answer to an earlier question, Chairman, uh, the number of appeals we closed in 2018 was double uh, the number that we closed in 2017. But I think we're, we're probably approaching the limits of our capacity with our existing resources. Now, as I say, there, there has been a uh, sanction granted by the Minister for a doubling of our staff numbers, uh, and there will be, uh, assuming the uh, that the legislation under consideration today is passed, there will be a doubling of the commissioner numbers as well. So we expect there to be a very significant increase in our closure rate once those additional resources have been put in place and, uh, and once they're, they're, they're operating. The opening statement makes reference to a doubling of the Commission's budget to accommodate recommended staff increases and improvements to ICT equipment. So it is a doubling of the staff as well as a doubling of the budget. Yeah, if I could put some details around it for you. Originally, the Commission, when it was first established back in March 2016, had two commissioners and four support staff. So at the moment, we're up to three commissioners and 14, I think, support staff. And the budget, and, the budget is there and um, the sanction is there and the recruitment is in progress to take that up to a total of, of 32, including commissioners, and that's uh, three, four, five, six, it's about 27, I think, support staff and commissioners. Gentlemen, just to let you interject there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah, prior to that, <laughs> there was, there was 2,000, 2,000 of additional legacy cases came from revenue commissioners, right? They would, staff would have been tied, tied up, up and down the country in revenue commissioners, in the local tax offices on these cases, right? These cases have now been basically shipped down to yourselves, right? So there's a problem here on staff, okay? The revenue commissioners were, de in the individual, like what was happening in reality here was they were going in an appeal, phone call was going in from, the, from whoever was representing the tax agent or accountant probably knew who the inspector dealing with them on a daily basis. And there was discussions ongoing in terms of cases. A lot of them probably were pulled out of being appeals. It was the way the, it worked. Problem is now is that everything has gone out. These staff who were dealing with it in each individual district are no longer dealing with it. The whole lot has gone into the appeals commissioner. My worry is to just end up becoming something where will be, uh, it'll be the process will be slow, tedious, legal in nature, not practical in nature, and I just worry that we're creating something here that's unworkable and bureaucratic, um, when in fact the previous system was just, uh, you could say, it might have been inefficient. So the question is, how do we as a committee get reassurance that we don't suddenly have a situation developing whereby barristers appearing before the Appeals Commission become the norm for clients or solicitors, which should not be the case, and it ends up just becoming another form of a court, as distinct from being something that's to assist people to get cases to be heard. Uh, you will have the hard cases, but they're hard cases, they'll end up in the courts. So I, 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 that's the gist of, that would be my concern of something that there's unintended consequences here, where you're setting up new bodies, which end up basically becoming, the mechanisms are foolproof 
but utterly bureaucratic and legal in nature, and we don't get the outcomes we're looking to get. So hopefully that will feed into your bring. Thank you very much for your me. very helpful introduction, <laughs> Senator O'Donnell. Uh, could, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if there's a couple of things we could just say in, in response to that. Uh, first of all, we are conscious that that is potentially an issue. It, it, as um, Commissioner Romani has said before, though, it's not the case that every appeal that comes into the TAC goes to a hearing or is a very formal process. So you'll be able to see from their annual reports, for example, the 2018. Most, Danny, I have no doubt. Yeah. In that figure of 2,700 that came, mm -hmm. No doubt, if you look at, at the individual tax districts around the country, some of them were highly efficient, mm -hmm. some weren't. Uh, but now everything is going into the same filter. Yeah. And I have, we've, we've a year backlog already, uh, and I have genuine concerns, right? So, sorry. If I could respond to that, yes. um, as I say, a lot of them are actually settled, uh, as I say, once they're notified to the TAC and then notified to revenue, a, a large percentage of them do settle. So, for example, of the 1,440 cases closed last year, um, 668 of those are settled, uh, 223 withdrawn. Um, so a lot of them do still settle, albeit they settle once they're first notified and then they settle. Separate to that, we are concerned that we make this a system that does work for taxpayers and particularly the, the small taxpayer with the small issue. So this is part of the, the purpose we have within, with the, the administrative group I mentioned that we've set up with the TAC and with the individuals in revenue who are particularly responsible for, on their side for the appeals process. And we're looking at options within that to see how we can make um, taxpayers, particularly the small taxpayer who, who looks after their own affairs, how we can make them better aware of their options to first contact revenue as a first port of call if it's a small, if it's a query, if it's an incorrect number, so that it doesn't go to the TAC. So that's something we are actively aware of and actively trying to find yeah. ways to address that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Maybe to some of those figures, the 2,700 that were transferred to us on commencement, um, a lot of work was done on, on those cases when they were received by us, and we netted them down to 1,157 appeals. So, for example, we were able to group yeah, yeah. Uh, some similar appeals in, into one appeal, and etc. And then, obviously, we wrote out, and some of them weren't proceedings, some of them uh, had been resolved, actually. Um, and there were a number of reasons, many of them fell away. And from that grouping of 1,157, Commissioner Kennedy then uh, commenced a process of uh, case management conferences, which is a small process where the parties can come in and a conversation can be had fairly informally okay. on some occasions and an opportunity for cases to resolve is there if people do want to talk and if they want to proceed then they can proceed. But at present we have now on the legacy side 658 of those cases remaining um, as at the 20th of May 2019 of this okay. year. And if I may just answer your issue, your question, the question that you raised on the issue of representation by barristers in the Commission, um, and this is a very broad brush stroke figure, but I would estimate that approximately 40% or above are not represented. And we have... Um, does that mean 60% does that, mean 60 that 60 are... I would say between 50 and 60, and that is a broad brush stroke. This is not um, so 50, a metric that we've so measured. So 50 to 60% of cases are represented by barristers? Again, I haven't measured that no, metric, but, but I, I'm giving you a broad No, but I'm saying that 50% of cases being represented by barristers is way too high for me. That means it's become a legal process. That was not mm -hmm. what the appeals process was set up to do. It's about barristers not high enough. <laughs> it's, set up, it's set up to help the taxpayer. And I have grave worries that it will end up becoming illegal process. And at any point, any person who's appealing to the Appeals Commissioner, the first advice they'll get from their tax advisor or their accountant is, it will be, I would recommend you have a barrister present. Because if you haven't a barrister present, most other people have. And that is something that, for me, will go against the spirit of the, uh, I keep calling it the old office, right? What it's, it's now called the Tax Appeals Commission, right? So, I'm sorry, but I would have a concern around that area. 
Uh, may I yeah. just yeah. continue, yeah. Senator? Yeah. Um, uh, representation obviously includes solicitors as well. I don't yeah, think I that, we that. differ on that. Well, um, I, I, I'm putting him in. I, I hope they won't take it. They'll take it in the spirit it's given. Yes. Uh, and I'm putting him in the same category, the legal profession. Yes. Would yeah. some of the representation be accountants? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. And the if I may to... include them also, yes. Oh, you're including are. them the legal profession? Do you, do you regard yes. yourself as...? No. <laughs> fees aren't high enough. <laughs> um, but I suppose, and maybe just, and obviously you may not even record these figures, but the, would more of the representation be likely to be from accountants? Um, than, than I'm from... actually getting to that point. Yeah, yeah. What, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to convey is that what I'm... T talking with you about, Senator, is the amount of hearings that actually run, i.e. live hearings. We have a facility in the Commission, a statutory facility, whereby we can dispose of cases that do require a hearing, but we can, we can provide a paper-based hearing, and many, many taxpayers avail of that. And yeah. I think that's a very um, advantageous facility yeah. for advisors because they can simply yeah, tell yeah. their clients, you don't even need to be there, you can opt for this facility, assuming the case is suitable. Um, and that is where I will sit down at my desk and I will give that case no less attention than but any the other case. the oral hearing. hearings? It's the oral so hearings. it's the oral hearings that I was talking about. So, so the oral you, hearings? Yes, the actual. And how many at oral hearings at the moment? And if you strip it away, put solicitors and barristers in one category and accountants in another category, what would be the percentage of legal people that would appear and then accountants appear? I honestly don't know the answer yeah. to that question, Senator, honestly speaking. Okay. Um, it's not a metric we've actually tried to measure in the Commission to date, mm. but we might have a look at that. Yeah. Um, but I will say, just finally, that we have also a statutory entitlement to take a flexible approach um, in cases um, you know, uh, where we feel that that's appropriate, because while some cases will be very um, significantly contested with appellants who are very heavily represented, many, many, many cases will not. And obviously, in, in those types of cases, uh, we will try and um, be as, as cooperative as we can be in terms of um, having the hearing be um, perhaps not a positive experience for people, but certainly an experience that they feel you know, that they've been okay. heard, they've been listened to. And if I may add also, um, essentially what we really want to convey is that, you know, we are not a division of the Revenue Commissioners and it's very important that taxpayers do understand that if they come to the Tax Appeals Commission or if they have their paper-based hearing, they will get an absolutely objective, expert review of their appeal, uh, independent um, of any other state body. And that's the service that we endeavour to deliver. So we hope to, we hope okay. to increase understanding around that. Okay, thank you. Okay. I might just come back on a few questions. Um, the 2,700 legacy cases are now down to 658, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So there's about 2,000, just over 2,000 cases have been dealt with. Are they, the, uh, and then we, we talked about in 2017 having 600 cases dealt with and in 2018 having 1,400 cases dealt with. Is that 2,000 most, uh, are those figures, the reduction from 27 to, to 658, just over 2,000, are those figures reflected in the 1438 in 2018? They and are, because those are total figures, as I yeah. understand it, yes. But I'm just, I'm just so trying to get my head around the fact that if, mm. if, if, it is, if it is the case that 619 were resolved in 2017 and 1400 were resolved in 2018, and almost all the cases that have been resolved are the legacy cases and nothing else has been resolved. No, I, I no. think when we, um. when we received the legacy uh, cases, Chairman, uh, we conducted a, a, a pretty detailed analysis of them and we were able to net down a lot of them. So, for example, the 2,731 would have included perhaps a number of appeals by the same appellant over a number of years but, but raising the same issue okay. and we would have consolidated those into to one appeal. Similarly, there were a number of lead follower uh, appeals where perhaps the, the, the same uh, tax planning issue was, was being appealed by multiple appellants and we said instead of 40 appeals. And, that's very, and that sounds very efficient and sensible to do so. I'm just wondering, when you netted down the five to one, is that a figure then that's called five resolutions? No, I, I don't believe so. I, I think the figures I gave you for, for the appeals closed were when, when we reduced the, the figure from uh, 2,731 to 1,100 odd, each of those 1,100 is, count, is counted as one for the, the purposes of closure. But the drop of 1,600 from 27 to 11, that's not reflected, that's, that's in, not reflected in the, in the figures closure. of the cases. No, it, it so really, the 27 became 1100, Correct. and the 1100 has been resolved to 658. 
Yes. That's right. About 500 of the 2,300 or so resolutions relate to the legacies. Yes. Commissioner Kennedy has been in office for just shy of two years now, and I think he's closed about 250 legacy appeals uh, per annum, Chairman. Well, if we, if we went from 1157 to 658, has he not closed 500? Yes. Or some so close before to, to 250 a year was okay. what I was saying. So oh, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in terms of the costs involved in a tax appeal on behalf, obviously people have to engage either their accountants or their barristers or solicitors and so on. Is there a, is there a fee to, to appeal or to make any charge? No, we, we, we don't levy any charges for our services, Chairman. Okay, so whatever, you, you incur the costs that are incurred and they're paid for through the Exchequer and that's, 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 that's it? That's correct. Okay, and um, is there a breakdown of companies versus individuals versus partnerships versus... I, I don't believe, I certainly don't have that breakdown uh, before me today, Chairman. Um, and equally, we sure. talked about some of the top figures, but I'm just wondering, at the, at the lower end, are there lots of under 1,000 or under 2,000? The, 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 the vast majority of appeals before us are less than 10,000 uh, euros, Chairman. Um, but as to whether those are appeals by uh, partnerships or, or, or small companies, again, I mean, uh, one of our issues has been the need to prioritise resources. We're limited in the number of mm. metrics that we can track and, uh, and a breakdown of the class of appellants uh, isn't one that we, we've tracked to date. Yeah, no, 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 it's just, just I'm trying to get my head around the, 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 the system of tax appeals because clearly, as we discussed this morning, and thank you for your engagement, it's, there is a, definitely an issue here and that's why you're here because we're, mm. we're providing increases in budgets and increases in, in computer equipment, ICT equipment and so on to, to, to try and resolve. I'm just getting my head around as to why it's taken so long, I suppose, to get to where we are, but it does look like there's some light at the end of the tunnel, certainly for the legacy cases, um, but I suppose at the same time that 1,689 cases came in last year. Now, if they're all quite small, you kind of go, okay, fair enough, but if they're dealing with over a billion and two of the ten are 1.67 billion, I mean, they're clearly very large um, cases with an awful lot at stake for the, the taxpayer and indeed the state, depending on whether, whether they have to give the money back or they don't. Um, is there a figure on the success rate or otherwise of, you know, you hear board panel, it's 30% it's of appeals or won or lost or whatever it was. Is there a figure for the, the number of times that who wins and who loses? No, that, that's not something that we, we, we track, Chairman. I suppose what I would say in the first instance is uh, every determination that we write goes on our website in anonymised form. So the results of every case that that has gone to a hearing uh, is available for the, the, the public to look at. But we... And, sorry, just what percentage goes to hearing, roughly speaking? Uh, I, I would... I'd say approximately 10%, and that's a rough metric. So we don't, see, we don't see what happens at a 90%, we just see what happens at a 10%. Correct. Yes. I mean, it, it, if an appeal is settled as between an appellant and revenue, we don't know the outcome of that. That's a, that's a confidential uh, agreement. So in relation to the 90%, if we refuse the appeal or if we dismiss the appeal, we can tell you what happened to those ones. But as you've seen, a, a very significant number settle while they're pending a, pending a hearing and we're not in a position to give a, to, to give a breakdown. But I, I think our, our focus is, is not on our revenue winning more cases, our taxpayers winning more cases. We want to give robust judgments uh, that, that will uh, withstand scrutiny. We're not, we're not really uh, keeping track. We're just we're interested mm -hmm. in getting it right. And I'm, I'm just, I suppose I'm just interested in are, are some people just putting in spurious uh, appeals on, in the hope that they might not have to pay something? Or, or generally speaking, people do have legitimate, genuine concerns. It may be misunderstandings. They may win. I'm just trying to get my head around... Um, the, the, I, I think there are some spurious appeals, Chairman, but the vast majority are genuine grievances or, at a minimum, a genuine misunderstanding of the, the, the revenue position or a, a genuine belief that, uh, that, that they have been incorrectly taxed. And, and typically, how long does it take for... I know we're talking about six years or, you know, we've, we've all these legs in, but a case comes in today. Um, on average, when will that be resolved? As, as I said, the average from receipt of notice of appeal to closure is 353 days, or just, just shy of a year. And is there a chance to improve that figure? Yes, there is. Down to, to again, in an ideal world? Uh, 
it, it will depend on the type of case of it is, Chairman. I mean, I, I don't, uh, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but mm. a very simple appeal. If, if we are fully staffed and it, it's clear that there has been a, a simple misunderstanding by revenue of something, that's something that could be resolved within a matter of months. I mean, th th there are certain time periods built into the legislation. One of the first things we do is when we notify revenue of the receipt of an appeal is we ask them, is this a valid appeal? Does it meet the statutory criteria for us to be able to consider it? And revenue have a 30-day period within which to object to the validity of the appeal. So with all the staff in the world, with all the budget in the world, there's 30 days that we can't get around. So it's very difficult to say at this juncture what an average time uh, should be or what a reasonable target uh, would be, but it will I suspect ultimately there will be possibly three different targets for simple, medium and, and highly complex uh, appeals, but in terms of putting a number on it, I don't think we're, we're quite in a position to do that yet. Okay. Um, just one final one. I just had a query from somebody about, and it, it, it may not be anything related, really, but it was about a farm consolidation scheme procedure, and it was, the, in theory, I think it was, you were supposed to get relief if you reduced the number of holdings you had, but they reduced their two existing holdings, bought a new one, and they were more or less told that didn't qualify. Is that something that the Tax Appeals Commission is with, or is that some other scheme, or have you ever encountered that kind of a...? I, I, I think we do have jurisdiction over, over a question uh, such as that, uh, okay. Chairman. I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I, I believe that we do. Okay, well, um, just, Mr. Gilvary, just on the other part of it, this prospective legislation, which we, we did talk about earlier, why is it in this bit of legislation? It sounds a bit strange that a, a bill called the Tax Appeals Amendment Bill 2019 has a whole lot of stuff that doesn't seem to be anything to do with tax appeals. Is it just for convenience that it's going into this bill? or it's well, <coughs> it's, Why is it not in a separate piece of legislation, I suppose? Um, convenience could be one way. The way we, this is as a consequence of European legislation, so the transposition date for the prospectus regulation is the 21st of July. So it was relatively late. We were, our intention was to make these amendments via secondary instrument because the requirements came through from uh, EU legislation. So the European Communities Act 72 would apply, but we have received advice, so therefore we need a vehicle. So it's kind of a flag of convenience to be... I, I wouldn't like to, to <laughs> say my colleague like is a flag of convenience, but it is helpful to have a vehicle that is moving along. And they are small, consequential amendments uh, to the Companies Act, a vast number of which are just updating d definitions from the 2003 Directive to the 2017 regulation. But you're, picking, you're piggybacking kind of on the, on the back of all the good work of your colleague in terms of being able to use this legislation. To we all work very closely together in the Department, right. it's all very good work. And, uh, for the benefit of all of us, and thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that, uh, Senator Burke. Yeah, two uh, questions. Uh, uh, if an appeal is successful, uh, and it is, it's within a certain area. Does, does it have a reflection on other appeals, we'll say, of a similar nature? That's a very good question. Um, uh, there are a couple of answers. First of all, if it is a standalone appeal and it sets um, um, a position um, in respect of a particular provision of legislation, it is conceivable that on foot of that position, um, and on consideration of that position that the revenue commissioners will take a particular view but uh, it's, it's not a necessity and any appeal may be appealed by a party who has not been successful so um, I guess the short answer is it depends. Yes but if there's a, uh, the appeal is successful we'll say it has a bearing on other, other uh, yes. appeals is that communicated to the to the Department of Finance or to the Revenue Commissioners and to drop the cases against similar type cases? Oh, well, that's, yes. Um, in fact, in the legislation we have, the Commission legislation in the Taxes Act, what we may do if we determine a an appeal in a particular manner under Section 949AN, we may write out to similar appellants who may have their appeals pending and we may enclose a copy of the redacted form of the original determination, the one you're referring to as having set a precedent of, of sorts. We may include that and we may then 
inform them that that decision has been made. Now at that juncture we will invite them to make representations to us if they wish to proceed with their appeal or if they feel that their appeal is um, significantly different to the appeal which has been determined. Um, so they still have a, a, an opportunity to, to convey their position vis-a-vis -vis wishing to progress with the appeal or not as the case may be. Um, but yes, we have a statutory facility that allows us to, to convey that information to similarly situated taxpayers who may be under appeal in the TAC. Fine. Yeah, and finally, in relation to inheritance, um, mm. particularly around the area of property, and we have seen in the last 10 years where property was very high, then it went down low, now it's on the increase again. Uh, when is the date taken for the property to... that this is? Well, you'd say that this is the date that the, the inheritance has taken place or took place or uh, how do you decide whether it's at the close or it's at a, a previous time uh, that the date is taken for the valuation of the property? Yes. So the valuation date is dealt with at section 30 of the Capital Acquisitions Tax Consolidation Act 2003 and there are various iterations in that provision, it's about a page long, that will set out when the valuation date crystallises depending on the facts and circumstances of the, um, of the, of, of the deceased, um, of the passing of the deceased. Um, so the short answer is it depends on a, on a given case when the valuation date will crystallise. Um, I appreciate your point. Um, Crystallisation of that date is a significant event in itself in terms of payment of tax. It can be very significant. Yes. In some cases, uh, it can be beneficial, I suppose, to other cases maybe, but uh, uh, there is a particular date anywhere that's set out in the Act, is it? Well, it, it, it is not so much a date as such, but there is a provision that deals with the valuation date and sets out the circumstances legally uh, whereupon that valuation date crystallises. And those circumstances um, basically arise from the, the, the nature and the, the circumstances surrounding the passing of the deceased. Uh, but effectively, that provision sets out and when How, how do you get the valuation of a particular property at a, at, at a particular time? Say you might have to get the valuation of a property four or five years ago. How do you, how, how is that got? Again, it, it's, it's uh, determined by the um, application of that provision, the valuation provision in the CATCA 2003. That provision is, is quite complex. It talks about um, rights and interests in property, um, as well as circumstances and entitlement to retain interests in property. And when that happens, it, it's quite legally complex, that area. So, I'm sorry I can't give you a clearer answer okay. on it, but it is quite a legally complex question. Thanks, Chairman. Yep. Thanks, Senator Burke. Uh, thanks, members, and thank you all for your very um, uh, detailed and helpful engagement about your opening statement and all of the work. And I wish you well with all of the work, and hopefully we will see the increase in staff helping in able to reduce those backlogs and give, I suppose, satisfaction one way or the other to people in, in terms of at least, I don't doubt that it's a very stressful time, I'm sure, for anyone putting in a tax appeal and it, it may have great impact on their lives and their mental health and so on. So that the fact that it is something that needs to be tackled and it is being tackled is good. Uh, and hopefully we will see um, vastly improved figures in terms of clearing this famous backlog uh, from the 658 down to zero sooner rather than later. And equally that you're managing cases uh, more efficiently over time. Um, than, and I accept that you inherited a lot of stuff, so you had to, you had to deal with that. Um, but I wish you, and I'm sure all of us wish you well in your work. Uh, and that concludes our discussions on this matter today. And I'd just like to thank you all for being here. And the Joint Committee is now adjourned until Thursday, the 13th of June at 2 p.m. Thank you all very much.